Big words. We use them a lot in church and we don't always explain them. This is the apse, that is the nave. Uh, this is the thurible, that is the thurifer. And we go, yes, yes, that's what they are. But we're not sure exactly what they are if we were given a test. I use fewer big words in sermons now than I did when I was young and clever. I think I was very proud once upon a time of all the big words that I knew, and I have forgotten half of them. And the word we're concerning ourselves with this morning is the word theophany. And this is occasioned by the presence of one of the classical theophanies of the Bible, which is the pillar of cloud and fire, which accompanied the Israelites in the Exodus. And these are classical examples of God showing himself. Theos, God. Phaneo or phanin in the infinitive, to show, to demonstrate, to shine. There are other big words that sound a bit like that. You've heard a couple of them. We'll get those out of the way. A theogony. Theogony was a poem by Hesiod that talked about the creation of the universe and how, how all the gods were generated. Theos or theoi, gods. Gonos, seed, theogony. Epic stories about how the gods are generated. Theodicy. Dike means goodness or righteousness. It's what the ancient judge would pronounce you when he acquitted you of a crime. He would pronounce you dike, good, righteous. Judges were more arbitrary back then than they are now. It would simply be the will of the judge to declare you righteous. There was no such thing as that uniquely Scottish verdict of not proven. Yes, God is righteous. God is righteous when he comes through for me or for my family or when he come, acts in accordance with how we expect him to act. Or no, maybe we complain that God is not righteous because we didn't get what we thought we were going to get or because his actions have become incomprehensible. One of the classic arguments about theodicy is the story of Abraham arguing with God about the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, saying, if God, you are righteous, then you will not destroy the seven or twelve or twenty righteous men and women in Sodom. Theophany. A theophany occurs every time God reveals himself. Smoke is not essential. When he speaks and demonstrates himself, that is a theophany. And it could be one of the classic theophanies of the Old Testament. God appearing in uh, the thunder and the, 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 the earthquake and in the still small silence. Um, God speaking to the disciples gathered there at the baptism of Jesus where a voice was heard from heaven saying, this is my son, the righteous one, listen to him. When the sheet is let down and Peter sees all the unclean animals on that sheet in this dream, in this vision, that is a theophany. But theophany doesn't even require big visual things. Immanuel Kant said, the greatest proofs I have of the existence of God are the starry heavens beyond and the moral law within. Somebody looking at the wonderful relationship of amphibians and plants in a pond which somehow dries up every summer but somehow is filled with life in the, win in the winter time and being struck by the glamour and the beauty and the order of what God has wrought is in fact witnessing a theophany. Sometimes God reveals himself dramatically and even unnaturally and in those cases, yes, smoke helps. Fire helps, lightning helps, but theophany is every time God reveals himself to people. There's a related word, that word is epiphany, which you are probably more familiar with, as a feast of the church on the 6th of January, but also thereafter as a season. But epiphany has entered our language in other ways than merely religion. If you are a cartoonist, and your character is having an epiphany, a sudden illumination, an insight, you're going to draw a light bulb over that person's head. 
And so for the logicians in the house this day, this is the way it goes. All, not all epiphanies are theophanies, but all theophanies are potentially epiphanies. But hold on a moment. God reveals himself and you say, I know him. Augustine said that if you think you know God, then you know something that is not God, because God is not encapsulated by our knowledge. And as I said, I think a couple of weeks ago, the fact that comprehension and apprehension can be used interchangeably in the same sentence means that when we know something, we put our arms around it, and we encircle it, and it is ours, and we have it. And such is not the case with the knowledge of God. And so it is perfectly comprehensible that you would witness some theophany and that there would be a remainder of things that you simply do not know and cannot understand. And so Ezekiel has this vision of this God surrounded by six-winged angels and giant wheels with eyes on them that rotate and the four cardinal beings of the natural order. And we can say that no, Ezekiel had a vision of God, but neither Ezekiel nor Maria Grazia understands completely what that means. There is always some remainder. And we, in the presence of God, understand our smallness because it is there, we are aware of its presence, but we do not know everything the presence says. If you buy that book, which is called How to Help a Friend, that book will tell you that when you are with a grieving friend or a troubled friend or a confused friend, you should, above all, keep your mouths shut and do not attempt to answer every question that comes up in the conversation. It is one of the cardinal sins of the young clergy person at a bedside is that they somehow feel impelled to answer questions, impelled to say why such a thing might have happened, impelled to say that it's going to be all right, impelled to say some platitude about strength or about the ups and downs of life, when that clergy person should just shut up. Because the presence of you with your friend may in itself be adequate and that you are alongside may be in fact all that is required and that you standing there as the little person witnessing either the dramatic theophany of God revealing himself in some dramatic way or the more subtle and winsome theophanies that we occur when we all of a sudden find that a word of hope has been placed in our heart inexplicably or that we begin to see some glimmer of something that might not be the tragedy of our life ahead of us or have some sense simply of a voice and a presence with us that presence is adequate and the chief lesson of every theophany is that God is present to his people in their times of richness, in their times of weakness, in times of feast and famine, God is present and alongside his people. This is the nature of hope. And it is God doing what he would said he would do. It is God doing what the prophets said he would do. It is God doing what the apostles have said God will do to us is to be present. Seek the skies. Look within your hearts. Pray. Open yourself to his presence. And in those moments of absence, recognize that in this Exodus story, which we read, where the presence of God, the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire protected the the Israelites from the Egyptian pursuers, that that cloud needed to move from ahead where it was clear and visual and the sign of God's presence with Israel. It needed to be taken from that place at the front of the line and moved behind to protect them from their pursuers. 
You and I know that our fullest moments, our moments of greatest joy, will not be the place and the time when we learn the most. It will be at that time when the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud has departed from in front of us and is protecting us in ways that we cannot imagine. That in the strife we grow, in the uncertainty we grow. Knowing that God has not answered all of those questions, nor has he pressed the button on the Coke machine to deliver the product at the bottom in the way that we had expected, but he has been present to us. And come hell or high water, will land us on the other side. Would you bow your heads with me?